I'd like to welcome everybody to our second organic animal husbandry conference in Hamburg and we have just finished the opening plenary session which was very well attended. It was an excellent session with a wide overview of the scope of organic animal husbandry. We've had three very interesting experts who gave us detailed knowledge on where things are now, where they believe things need to go, particularly in relation to food security and climate change. With that, it's enough from me. What, what I'll do now is start introducing you to our keynote speakers and I have some questions for them. So, our first speaker I'd like to introduce is Fritz Snyder. And Fritz, one of the things we were talking about in terms of meeting the protein needs for food security in the future is that fixing up the efficiency gap, in other words, working with the systems we have now and improving the production. And I'd just like to have some of your ideas on how you think you could do it and if you do have extra knowledge on ways to do it organically. Uh, <clears throat> I have to go back to the slide of uh, beer, where he showed that in the livestock uh, value chain, that feed is actually very, very important. And to uh, narrow the efficiency gap is definitely to, to have uh, varieties producing uh, better on the same, the same resources. And there, there's a huge potential. And this potential is still in, in breeding varieties and then also in better management of the areas we are growing mm -hmm. feed on, be it uh, grain or be it uh, grass. So that is, that's on the, on the feed side, we have a huge uh, potential still. But also then on the, on the production systems, if you, for instance, you take uh, dairy, the breeding associations all over the world still breed for the highest yields. As we breed for the fastest running horse, they breed for the cow that gives the highest yield of milk, which is not efficient. We, we have research programs going on and we show that the cow giving six or seven thousand kilograms of milk, uh, living longer, being healthier, uh, can be more efficient uh, than the, the high yielders. So we have to rethink also that we have to optimize and to maximize the systems. So in this case, when you're talking about efficiency, it's feed conversion yeah. to milk output. Yeah. Yeah. The other one which we're very interested in and that you ended your presentation in is called the Global Agenda for Action and you suggested that iPhone should be involved. I found that very interesting and I personally would like to know how do you suggest that we could so that we can be a part of this process. You see, when, when we started maybe 15 years back with the Livestock Environment Development Initiative, it was a rather small community doing that. And uh, now in this uh, agenda of action, it's very important that uh, all relevant stakeholders are involved. So we are trying very hard now to get the private sector involved. And I think we will we'll get that. But we don't want, uh, or it's not the aim to have individual companies in there. But we have the International Dairy Federation in there, we have the Meat Secretariat, Secretariat in there. And I think we should have uh, if one more uh, also there, because uh, uh, we, we want all the stakeholders and we want real uh, progress. We don't want uh, just a kind of a as we call in German, another paper tiger. And I think also what Alan talked about, I think that's very relevant to be in that issue. Well, I like the idea that it is inclusive, inclusive of sector representation, and I think <coughs> from my point of view, I'll be following up on this. So, uh, it's one of the, for me, one of the really good things that have come out of today. I'd also like to introduce Pierre Gerber. 
paper from FAO, and Pierre really went delved into started from where Fritz left off and then delved into more detail. One of the areas which I found was fascinating is the area of photosynthesis and carbon sequestration in grazing systems and some of the research that you're doing to show what I thought was a very good global map. And I know our members would be very interested in learning more about this and just talk about the research, where it's at, and particularly where it needs to be taken. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the when the um, IPCC released the fourth assessment report, um, they really identified um, the potential to sequester carbon in the grassland as a major opportunity for mitigation, uh, combined with adaptation, actually. Um, it was really seen because of the sheer magnitude of the sheer uh, space in the grassland nowadays on the planet, because also of the importance pervasive issue of degradation, loss of carbon in ecosystems, and the capacity to, bring, to gain back that carbon, this was really seen as a major mitigation opportunity. And uh, we know different practices, managements, uh, that can allow to restore those systems or improve on those systems to get some, some carbon back, so to get the carbon back through the photosynthesis, right? To take it from the atmosphere, and then it's brought either as vegetation biomass or as organic matter in the soil and that's the way it is sequestrated on those, uh, in, in these ecosystems. We know practices, uh, Alan showed very, very thriving examples of how this can be done in dry environments. There are other practices for other environments too. And we also know that it's, in, it's associated with very strong co-benefits. Co-benefits in terms of water management and water availability, co-benefits in terms of biodiversity, in terms of uh, productivity of the system, and therefore it has a, a foot into adaptation to climate change. So it's it's really a huge potential. Um, but but we have some some problems with it in terms of mitigation practice. Uh, one is that we are not very well able to measure it. It's very difficult to measure carbon stocks and increasing carbon stocks in those ecosystems because of the variability, both spatial and temporal variability, and also because you're measuring a small increase over a large pool of, of carbon. So that's that's complicated. So if you want to measure that environmental service and maybe even promote it or fund it, then the measurement becomes a problem. And the second uh, problem we have or issue we have at stake is the permanence of carbon sequestration. <coughs> what happens if the, the land gets degraded again? Do you release that back to the atmosphere? So how for how long have you been sequestrating? For how long have you been so, so th these questions are, are quite central, and, and, and those are the things that we are engaging in, and not alone. We work on with the Colorado State University, we work with APRA, we work with a number of all the other organizations with that. And, and there are two, two dimensions. One is to reassess a little bit the totem, total potential, and that's the map I, I presented today to understand what, what is there. And maybe it has a little bit been overestimated in the past, but there is still something, but narrow it down a little better. And the second is to progress on measurements. Uh, and, and we have a, a pilot project in Xinhai, uh, China, uh, where we try to, uh, to develop both uh, restoration practices and a methodology through which we can link uh, or we can certify the amount of carbon that has been sequestered by implementing those uh, restoration practices. So um, eventually we could generate carbon credits out of this restoration. So estimating the potential and the measurement issues. We will be very interested in learning more about the research and if there's preliminary results we would love to be able to sure. So look thank you Pierre and with that I'd like to now go over to Alan who is actually being actively involved in restoring grazing systems and what Alan does is regarded in many cases as quite controversial. But I think there's the old saying that a picture is worth a thousand words and you show some very good pictures. Uh, it's very convincing on what you do. Plus for myself and others who are actually 
been following your work for I'd say more than 30 years. Uh, we've, I've seen it also on um, three continents, the results with my own eyes. One of the, I, I think for our members here, there's two questions I'd like to ask is firstly, the concept, the importance of reintegrating animals into arid systems and what they do in terms of, I suppose, reinvigorating the soil, getting growth back. I'd like you to talk about that. And then the second one is the, what I call the time, um, time of bringing in herds of animals through these systems to both disturb and regenerate. Well, in the, in the first, two, I wasn't talking about arid, uh, semi-arid areas. Some of the areas we're working in are, um, you know, 2,000. Some of the areas we're working in are, you know, 1,000, 2,000 millimetres. Yes, I know. More rain. It's, it's the seasonal rainfall, and we need to get thinking about that, not arid and semi-arid. And in those seasonal rainfall areas, where when you get to the dry period of the year, the millions of tons of vegetation that is grown, all right, dies above ground. Leaf falls to the ground from trees that decays. Grasses can't graze themselves. It stands in the air and it oxidizes, kills the grasslands, and we blame overgrazing. No, that's why people started burning grasslands thousands of years ago to try to keep them alive. The burning keeps the individual plants alive, but it exposes the soil gradually the whole thing declines to desertification. So with seasonal rainfall, we need to bring large herbivores back, wildlife, livestock, etc. And livestock are practically the only thing we can really control and do, so we need to do that. And then the key to it is two things. One is the timing because of the overgrazing of plants. But the overgrazing of plants is not the big evil that people think it is. I showed you pictures today of where there's been no overgrazing for 70 years and it's worse desertification than where plants are overgrazed. The big evil is overresting seasonal rainfall environments. Now the ecological, the economic, the military, the political significance of that is mind-boggling because that's about two-thirds of the world we're talking of, land, which is underused, not overused. But the oceans are overused, the forests are overused, not these seasonal rainfall areas. So the, the, we've got to get that significance over to people. Now, the timing is critical to minimize the overgrazing of plants, but it's also critical for the trampling, because anything in excess is a, is a, becomes a pollutant. Excessive trampling is damaging. Excessive dung, urine and feedlots is, is a pollutant. When they're not in excess, they're beneficial. So I drink the water from our stream, despite all the elephants, the buffalo, the increase in livestock. You can drink from the water right by my home, because it's not a pollutant. Okay, so that's because of timing. And so the planning is essential to get recovery and graze to trample ratios right. And it's very, very simple stuff. It's not rocket science. So with our herders who are herding, we plan the land on virtual paddocks. There's no fencing because of the elephants and economics and other reasons. Fencing is a backward step in actual fact. We can do better by herding because we can concentrate the animals more. So we get the physical impact, the dung, the urine, the trampling, the laying litter, and any gardener knows that. That causes water to stay in the soil, causes plants to grow, causes carbon to go down in the soil, etc. So we do that and we, we just get the graze trample to recovery ratio right. Now with our herders, we do the bigger planning on, on, a, on a chart, but they come into one area and they're there too long because they're going to be there for 15 days. Well, that's too long for any plant. So all we do is tell the herders, herd for three days over there, no more than about three days. It doesn't have to be accurate. Two or three days there, two or three days there. When your 15 days is up, we go to the next area. So it's maybe six months before we come back here. So any plant, any square meter of soil has had trampling, done, urine, for no more than three days, followed by about six months recovery. And we do away with resting the land. We just do this constant disturbance plan. And we always plan it backwards from recovery periods because those are the most crucial. And I, I do want to stress the utter simplicity. We've got barely literate people doing it wonderfully. Yeah. Well, I can say, from my point of view, having been to several farms on, on three continents that use your system, 
to me that, you know, as we say, the proof is in the pudding. The, the results are quite spectacular. And on my uh, speech, on my talk on, um, on the 14th, I'll actually show the difference between the soil and a holistic management using your system and, and set grazing. So with that, I'd like to now introduce everybody to Marcus Arbens, who's our executive director. And Marcus moderated the session. And Marcus, I'd like you to give your overall impressions. What, what, what were the main things that you took out of this? What were the key message, messages that you think our members should take from this morning's session? Well, first of all, I hate a little bit to make up key messages for everybody because everybody takes his own messages and that's what you actually witness in the audience, that people come from several backgrounds and several interests and everybody has its own interest. But maybe from an institutional point of view, or, or I could actually say that I was quite thrilled to see actually first this, let's say, analytical work coming actually from the challenges because the, the whole conference is called Tackling the Challenge, that's what we want to do. And um, I heard actually one thing is tackle the challenge and do not shelter them. So I quite liked it as a slogan. <laughs> and I think this is a, it's a really good also an attitude which can describe very much of, of what we want to do and how we want to actually address things. So tackling the challenge. So we heard those challenges. We heard actually uh, a lot of things like a cons consumption which is going up, the waste problem. We thought about the feed, very crucial thing. Uh, the, how do we feed the animal, from where is the feed coming, what do we feed and what kind of animals do we feed, all this kind of actually uh, analysis came to very comprehensive and very thoughtful I felt. Uh, so I'm quite grateful to that, that we have really actually uh, a very serious and, and very sound background on, actually on, the, on the facts. But there were also other uh, issues which we talked about, uh, maybe not so much in the center, this is for example biodiversity. Biodiversity in terms of the, the wildlife, uh, you mentioned that a little bit, but Fritz, you also mentioned biodiversity in terms of animal genetic resources. We know that we lose a lot of animal genetic resources. How do we develop them further? Soil, of course, was uh, also a major issue. And all these kind of things actually we, we tackled, we, we dealt with, and, and I felt that quite interesting. Now, of course, to analyze, to find an agreement and analyze, it usually goes rather quick. Or not, not quick, but the, that goes rather smooth, I would say. Because we find agreements on analysis because it's looking back. Now, looking forward is already more, more difficult. And I heard a bit the thing, all options open, which is, of course, the messages which we know from FAO and which we also get sometimes a bit impatient about because we feel actually we've done a lot of mistakes in the past. The conventional paradigm actually leads to all the problems we have. And I mean, some people say organic okay, cannot feed the world, but I can say can okay, conventional agriculture feed the world. No, it can't. We have to want to build it hungry people. We have to conventional paradigm, and it can't feed the world. That's we have evidence for that. We don't have evidence that we could do it, but we also don't have evidence that we could not do it. So we feel actually that a more decentralized system, a more diverse system, and more actually based on system mimicking nature rather than this logic of of uh, industrialization, with inputs in a, a short process in, on, 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 the, on the plan and then later on on, on the marketing and disintegration of production market, even disintegration of prices of production with the market price, all this causes actually a lot of problems. And I think we should, we should really seriously look into that and not so much in, in giving recipes. I mean, that's not really our intention and I think the, that's what your message was as well. You, you said actually, Sudan people will ask a question. I can't just export my technology to you, but we can commonly have to look at it, analyze the thing, and think what makes best sense in a diversity of actually situations. So this decentralization, I think, seems to be a very important point, actually, and uh, that this we call it alternative paradigm, uh, organic paradigm, that this way of thinking comes in, that we were more <coughs> participatory, more actually based on, on diversity and, and principle of nature. Actually, I suppose what I'd like to end on, you, know, you mentioned the word, the alternative paradigm, but also when a lot of this information was presented and we deliberately 
chose speakers who are not from the organic sector so we don't preach the converted. It's very important that we have good experts who can give us knowledge. But did you find that there was a lot there that we, that we are already doing and there's other areas that we need to engage in as well? Well, first of all, I want to mention that I heard a lot of messages which I could really agree very much and I was very happy to hear now for some of the food waste, the whole waste issue. Also, the, the message which you discussed, Fritz, about rather going to the, to the middle ground and not to the top, actually, uh, to improve there because there's much more potential. All these kind of things I have very much, very much in agreement with that. So now, as far as the organic paradigm, <laughs> or the organic strategy is concerned, I think uh, we have a lot of need for development because we neglect actually livestock over crop production. The organics, they come always from the soil, which is important, but from the soil we should integrate and actually we often did the mistake that organic people did dislike a little bit the animals eh? and preach the same mistakes eh? like overgrazing or or like uh, uh, putting the, the animals out of the systems. I think. Uh, uh, we rather went away to the mixed system, a message which also came from Fritz to say don't like, specialize too much but, but make it integrated, holistic, and we have there excellent examples. I want to remind you of an initiative which came from Bandana Shiva in India, uh, which they said uh, let's measure the health parade which we produce, not just like the calories parade, <coughs> but what is actually the diversity of production you bring in. And then we come to more the system thinking, and then we bring in actually uh, not only the, the yields, which is often mentioned, but also uh, a diversity of other crops, like species, herbs, the animals, but not only like the, the, the pigs and poultry, but also the bees and the, maybe the, the pigeons, or I don't know what, a lot of big, big diversity. 